Greetings, everybody. On this, the World Day for Decent Work, we are fighting today all around the world for the elements of a new social contract for recovery and resilience. I wanted to actually interrupt your day to say thank you. Say thank you for the issues that you are highlighting in every country. Thank you for the work you did in the first phase of COVID-19, where you went all out to support workers in your demands with uh, access to uh, job protection, wage protection, incomes, of course, for those in informal work or without uh, wage support, access to health and many other areas of the social contract. Of course, you are fighting now to retain them as governments threaten to withdraw that support. And we're seeing a distortionary spend around the world. Decent work has broken down even before COVID-19. We had a convergence of crisis where inequality was driving an age of anger. People couldn't live on the wages or the incomes they were receiving. Job security was breaking down and 40% only of the world's people could actually depend on a formal job, a third of those in precarious work. But in fact, 60% of our brothers and sisters have no guarantee of formal work. Indeed, uh, you know, it was a, um, uh, without a rule of law, without social protection, without indeed any kind of minimum wage or income. So the fight for rebuilding trust in our governments in if they actually rebuild the foundations for recovery and resilience, for decent work with a new social contract is now a struggle for the generations. And today is a major day in taking that fight for the new social contract further. I wanted to actually say, of course, it isn't just uh, the ITUC leadership, and I'll introduce a special guest to you shortly, but it isn't just the ITUC leadership who has debated what we want in our social contract. So we thought today we would show you the results of a thousand workers. We asked a thousand people what they wanted in a new social contract. And you will see behind me some of the results of that very shortly. But you can see that uh, when it actually um, is about decent wages, you've got a massive, massive, overwhelming percentage of people who want that. Sick leave and unemployment benefits, fundamental resilience in social protection, pensions, health care, same rights for all workers, equal pay, just transition for, uh, for climate friendly jobs, and indeed, of course, safe workplaces and just transition for technology changes with grievance procedures and that vital due diligence responsibility that we want for all companies and, uh, and the right to control and over our data and an end to the surveillance economy. Skills and training, all of these issues have come from people themselves. And I want to say to you that this is not the end of it. We need your views. We need you to tell us what you want in your social contract for yourselves and your families. Because that's the way the union movement will fight, right alongside of you, indeed with you. And I wanted to alert you to two major parts of the struggle for a new social contract. We have launched as an ITUC with the support of some governments led by the French government and indeed uh, the special rapporteur for um, uh, extreme poverty and human rights, uh, Olivia de Schutter. We have launched the campaign for a, a global social protection fund because many of you know, I'm sure, that in fact, you know, 75% of the world's people have little or no social protection. 55% have none at all. And that's not the resilience base we need for a new social contract. So today, as we stand and demand jobs, jobs and jobs, climate friendly jobs, fundamental rights at work, social protection, all of the things that we say and the ILO Centenary Declaration says, negotiated just last year, ought to be available for all workers. 
then we know that social protection is at the heart of resilience for income support and for health, plus those vital public services. And the other campaign I wanted to say to you that's absolutely critical right now is a request to go tell your governments, tell your employers, it's not acceptable that they deferred discussion at this November's governing body of the ILO of making safety and health a fundamental right. This was absolutely agreed as part of those core of rights for all workers as we rebuild the social contract. And in order to get that done at the ILO's conference next year, we need to see it on the agenda and the actual text to go to the conference agreed. The fact that employers and many governments colluded to defer discussion is not acceptable. We will fight for fundamental rights at work to include occupational health and safety and to join with, of course, that commitment to a minimum living wage or income and, uh, and regulated maximum hours of work as the floor for all workers. We call it the labour protection floor. So we have much to fight about. So I wanted to just, before I introduce our special guest, highlight some of the magnificent actions around the world and indicate how proud everybody is of being part of this great union family. The ITUC knows that its affiliates, building workers' power through our membership, that's where we can change the world. So if you look at Africa, Kasatu's strike action today to protest against corruption, fantastic, because corruption eats away at the very heart of our societies and decent work. And then of course, Indonesia, where they're protesting a government who's abandoned its, its people with a law that not just takes away rights and undermines minimum wages, but actually opens up the floodgates for foreign capital and the, and the government put that before indeed its own people. So we'll fight right alongside of them. We're seeing uh, Chuka and the Guffs with an online forum about the public is in public hands and to fund those public services, we say tax, not austerity. The IUF is fighting for the tourism sector and I can tell you because you already know this is devastated. This sector has been devastated. And if we need to rebuild all sectors, then tourism is certainly part of it. Uni's uh, action today, the Uni Global Union, for those courageous and amazing frontline workers is indeed an incredible piece of solidarity. It says dignity, health and a union, essential rights for essential workers, a wage with dignity, uh, paid sick leave, workplace safety, special status during a crisis and collective bargaining with union representation. That's the real basis of a social contract you can touch. And uh, that, of course, for our courageous health workers, for our care workers, for all those workers who went to work and still go to work every day to make sure we can survive, but put their own uh, their own lives on the risk uh, on at risk, and of course that of their families. And then you know sectoral actions. CNN, uh, uh, CNV in in the Netherlands is supporting unions struggling for a living wage for the sugarcane sector. In Panama, we see a focus on multinational companies' impact on decent work. And we know the dehumanising supply chains that uh, workers face everywhere, that has to shift. Of course, uh, the solidarity is extraordinary. You go from the CNV to CCWO and, and the UGT Spain, mobilising for decent work with the Chilean unions, and actually looking with Chuka again to where new constitutions in governments can help us rebuild trust in government and decent work. And, uh, and there's much more in every, every area. There's an incredible outpouring of activity and a demand for decent work to sit at the heart of a new social contract. But I promised you today a special guest and indeed, we have a fighter, a warrior for workers, someone who's, who has continues the fight 
for uh, decent work, for minimum wages, for social protection, for collective bargaining, who negotiates with employers in the face of this terrible tragedy and who leads workers to make the demands on his government. But he's also very special to us because not only is he a warrior in his own country as the president of the Nigerian Labor Council, he's our president, the president of the ITUC. I can tell you, this is a man we can all be proud of a union hero, indeed, Ayuba Woba. And I want to ask Ayuba to tell us what the situation's like in Nigeria for both those workers who have formal jobs, but also for informal workers, and what we need to do about it and how we can support those, uh, those country leaders in Africa who are absolutely standing up for a better future. Ayuba, I'm pleased to have this conversation with you today. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, let me join you and uh, our workers and trade unions around the world in commemorating this year's World Decent Work Day with the team, a new social contract and recovery for resilience uh, in the mix of this devastating effect of COVID-19 on jobs, health and economies around the world. Uh, no doubt, the COVID-19 has further exposed the inadequacies of the current flown economic model of globalization, uh, occasioned in many countries by accumulation of wealth and lack of social justice. Uh, for us in Nigeria and particularly in Africa, it has been a double tragedy because one, uh, you remember that before the COVID-19, uh, the major commodities around Africa, including Nigeria, uh, the oil and gas, the price have also crashed and therefore workers have been at the receiving end. In fact, in many, many of our production lines, the production lines were actually affected. There was disruption in over 90% of our production lines. And you know what that means? Where there is actually disruption of production line, uh, the first casualty will be the workers. Uh, so particularly in an economy, uh, where the informal sector actually uh, accommodate more than 80% of our workers is certainly a, a double uh, tragedy. Uh, so in the context of Nigeria and Africa, uh, the informal sector workers uh, who are actually the nerve of our economy have been worse hit. And uh, in many cases, most of them were left without any social security protection, any social security cover, because uh, you also know that uh, in the context of Nigeria and many African countries, the social security cover is less than 20%. So you can imagine the exposure that these have already led many of our workers. Uh, this has resulted to many workers losing some of the gains that we have been able to make. You have mentioned some of them. Uh, sick leaves are no longer being paid. Uh, even the minimum wage we have fought for uh, very hard to end was also under threat because some employers say, well, with the COVID-19 challenge, it's therefore obvious that we cannot also continue to actually pay the minimum wage, can we negotiate? But we have forced our way through, and we have insisted that even within the context of COVID-19, uh, workers must work in dignity, workers must continue to earn wages, and fundamental rights of workers that have also come under attack must continue to be respected by employers. And we responded, and uh, I think I most appreciate our Nigerian employers. They were forthcoming. We were able to actually come to the negotiation table where we dialogued and we saw the centrality of both of us working together for the benefit of the employer and also for the benefit of the worker. And we came up with an MOU that will actually defend jobs in both the informal sector and also the formal sector of the economy. And uh, all of us, we are committed to a process of making sure that no worker should be able to lose his job and also leave, uh, lose means of uh, livelihood due to the COVID-19 challenge. And I think that is a model that many countries around Africa and around the world have also tried to borrow. Uh, I think there is certainly an advantage in having a social dialogue around the issues of uh, the challenge of COVID-19, which is also not happening in many, many countries. In fact, in many countries, government are now using the COVID-19 as an excuse to attack workers' rights, including the fundamental right of workers belonging to trade union, and including the issue of social dialogue and social justice, including attacking collective bargaining agreement that have been signed many, many years ago. So I think this is where the issues are. And I think 
it's really a time to demand for a new social contract for recovery and resilience uh, that will be able to protect those rights and gains we have been able to make. But importantly, also to advance issues of decent work, uh, because the new social contract must actually advance the issues of decent work, in, importantly, the central declaration, where the issue of social protection, social security protection should be central, and we must identify champions. And uh, in this case, like our employers, I can say that they are champions that we have been able to identify to work with workers to be able to advance issues of social justice and importantly, issues of making sure that the core values of Haile, including the core values that all of us have fought for over the years, are not only protected, but we must continue to advance them. And I think in that collaboration I've seen uh, in Nigeria, uh, our employers that have been forthcoming and uh, they have spoken very well about the fact that despite the challenge that they must also recognize the contribution of workers over the years, because workers have worked to build economies. Workers have worked also to create wealth. Uh, so with this uh, short shock, we should not then transfer the blame and the challenge only to workers, that we should see workers as partners in progress, and we should continue to work with them. And I think that is the collaboration that have come out clearly from our engagement with our employers here. And the government then has no option, because we then started this collaboration with the employers, and then government have no option than to key in and uh, also begin to sing now the new song of saying that uh, workers deserve protection in this very challenging period. So this is how far we have gone. And I think with this, we have also been able to get our government to come up with 774,000 uh, 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 direct jobs. We call them public jobs, actually for those unskilled workers and those that have no means of livelihood. Uh, uh, we have come up with about 700,000 uh, uh, in each local government and we have 774 local governments. So as I'm talking to you, that project is going to last for about six months. It's a, like a kind of social security cover for the most vulnerable group in our society. Those that have little skill, but are workers, little skill, they have lost their jobs and therefore they need something to actually rely on uh, to continue to take care of their family. So we have gotten all of this through this process of engagement. Importantly also is the issue of uh, extending palliative uh, to the poor of the poor. Uh, although this has not been uh, very, very uh, far-reaching to the people uh, because uh, it has been diverted along the way. So these are areas also that we are engaging so that this palliative, including uh, transport palliative, uh, including the protection of PPEs, should be extended to all frontline workers, including our security agencies. Uh, because uh, I will tell you that last week I was with the Inspector General of Police and it's uh, really cheering to say that why should we not come and in, actually organize the police? Uh, because so that the Inspector General can now concentrate on the issue of providing security. But on welfare of the police, he is actually averse to the fact that we are doing a good job and therefore uh, the Nigerian Labour Congress should come and organize the police into union so that we can continue to defend their rights because they have seen that we have actually uh, broken even in the fight to protect frontline workers uh, in the fight against COVID-19 by forcing government to provide PPEs and also incentive to frontline workers. I want to tell you that uh, we have also been able to fight government to provide one, uh, what we call hazard allowance for all frontline workers, 50% of their salary. And also uh, we have been able to get other incentives uh, for frontline health workers, especially health workers, the doctors, and all workers that are working in the isolation center and the health centers. We have been able to fight for that and they have continued to end uh, those salaries and pays through a process of collective bargaining and negotiating with government. So I think this is how far we have gone and I think the way to go forward uh, to address future shock and also to make sure that we have now uh, the opportunity uh, to engage all governments and all employers for a new social contract that will guarantee uh, those core values, uh, those uh, gains that we have been able to make uh, even at the IO level, uh, even at, uh, at a global level, we should be able to protect those uh, very core rights that we have earned over the years that are now under attack, including fundamental rights. The right to belong to a trade union, the right to collective bargaining, the right to minimum wage, the right to occupational health and safety, and uh, the right to be paid sick leave, which I think are under attack now. We, knew we need, certainly, at this point in time, a new social contract that will guarantee those rights. And I think uh, in the context of Nigeria and Africa, we have tried our best. We are not yet there, but we'll continue in this line. And I think this opportunity, this day, provides us an opportunity to share what we have been able to do and also to encourage each other in going forward to continue to protect the dignity of workers and the dignity of workers. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you, President Wobba. And I think all of you now know why we are so proud to have this man as our president. And I know that the Nigerian workers are proud too to have him as their president. I've stood with him on the front lines and look at the things he's talked about. Hazard pay, 50% for frontline workers. Many developed countries have not achieved that level of support for workers on the front line of this virus, serving us every day. Negotiating with employers to try and save jobs, to save uh, jobs and wages. Taking joint demands to the government. And of course, he knows more than anybody that there are so many people, 1.6 billion around the world, workers facing destitution every day in the informal sector. Because if there's no money, then survival becomes a premium. So we know that uh, with leadership like Ayuba and many other leaders across Africa, then we are in good hands. There's no doubt that we can find similar leaders with incredible courage in those struggles that I referred to and many others around the world. But I think today having uh, Ayuba as our special guest really says it all. If you can fight for decent work in Nigeria, in the continent of Africa, which remains one of the most underdeveloped in the world, then we can fight anywhere. So our thoughts are with you today, but I want to leave you with a few challenges. I want to actually uh, say to you that when you talk about the new social contract, it's most important, of course, that you talk about what's important to you and you spread that word in your workplace, in your homes, in your communities, because that's the way we will build the content. I think the union movement can be proud that everybody's talking about a new social contract. Everyone is talking about just transition for uh, climate friendly jobs. But we need to put the content behind the, those headlines. And of course, we know, as Ayuba said, that the labour protection floor for all workers, formal, informal, is vital. You must have fundamental rights. You must have occupational health and safety. You must have minimum wages or incomes on which you can live with dignity. And you must be able to actually guarantee that you have maximum, and we would say minimum hours of work. But at the same time, we need a transformative agenda to include women in our societies in equal numbers, to manage the investment that, uh, or to, to actually achieve the investment we need in care, in education, healthcare, childcare, aged care. So women in particular can depend on that care, actually have good jobs in care, but also look then to jobs in the broader economy because they can rely on that care for their families every day. We must also make sure that the transition in both climate uh, uh, demands, as we know we have to transition, to a future where we stabilise the planet in every sector, but also in technology, that they're just transitions. And I already said we need to involve uh, uh, our to total commitment in the fight for our vital public services. Never again can we stand back and see health and education and care underfunded. It's the fabric of our societies. So the fight continues for decent work, but today, We've been very privileged, I think, to have Ayuba as our special guest. And I know he would want me to say from both of us, the President and the General Secretary of the ITUC, thank you. Thank you for your pride in uh, decent work. Thank for your, you for your courage to stand on the front lines of the struggle for decent work. And thank you for actually taking the fight for a new social contract to make sure that we can rebuild trust in our communities, in our governments, because the dignity of decent work, the dignity of decent work supported by social protection is secure for every worker on the planet. Have a great day. Don't forget to go to our uh, website, go to the Action Centre and tell us what you want in your social contract. In fact, you can also take part 
in uh, telling us what you will do to help us rebuild trust in democracy, because that's vital to actually ensure that we have governments who will listen to workers, who will have tripartite negotiations around putting people at the centre, people and decent work at the centre of a better future. Let's uh, join hands around the world throughout the day. Already we've seen Asia, Europe's online. We'll look to Latin America later today. And of course, those regions like the Arab region struggling for peace and development, they are all part of our family. We're very proud of you all. Thank you for a great day. The fight continues. Solidarity. <laughs>